I'm Miss Caitlin and for First Chapter Friday we're going to be covering The Only Black Girls in Town by Brandi Colbert. Brandi Colbert has written young adult books such as Little and Lion and The Revolution of Bertie Randolph and this is her middle grade debut. So it follows Alberta who lives in a small California beach town. It's the kind of town that has a bunch of tourists during the summer and then is dead for the rest of the year. So unsurprisingly she is the only black kid in her grade and the amount of kids near her age that are black, she can count on one hand. So she is thrilled to find out that the bed and breakfast across the street from her house has been sold and sold to a black family. So Edie and her mother come from New York City and despite the fact that they have some clear differences, Alberta loves to wear colors and she loves to surf and Edie can't swim, loves to wear black and black lipstick and reads classic literature. They become friends because they do find some similarities. They both love horror movies, and in a town that small, they bond over the fact that they are both black girls and they both understand what it's like to be black. So they are just starting to get to know each other and then they find the journals. The journals that are in Edie's bedroom, which used to be the attic of the bed and breakfast. So they start reading them and they find it is written by somebody named Constance in the 1950s. So they just want to figure out who Constance is, what happened to her, what is the secret that she's been keeping. So they are completely enthralled in this mystery, but life happens and life ends up distracting them a bit. Edie misses home, she misses her dad, and she's really struggling with being in a new town away from everything she's ever known. And Alberta has her own struggles. Her best friend Laramie has become friends with the mean girl in school so she's worried that she's gonna be losing her best friend. And her surrogate mom, Denise, has moved in temporarily as she is pregnant and her husband is going to be traveling. So she's struggling with these ideas of living with her surrogate mother and trying to understand her relationship with this new expectant baby. So, you'll have to see how they solve the mystery of Constance as well as how they deal with their own personal issues and their emerging friendship. So if that's not incentive enough to try this book out, I'm gonna read the first chapter and we'll see if that hooks you. Chapter one, blending in. I'd be sad that today is the last day of surf camp if I weren't so busy trying to ignore the worst person alive. Our instructor Irene just passed out the trophies. Everyone got one, of course. They all say the same thing at the bottom. Ewing Beach Surf Camp with the year engraved underneath. There's a tiny gold surfboard sitting on top. Next to me, Nicolette McKee is repeatedly kicking the balls of her feet into the sand. Trophy held slack at her side. I have to see her at school and all over town because Ewing Beach is tiny. And then there's the fact that she lives across the street. So I also have to see her just about every day of my life. But the end of surf camp means the start of school and Nicolette is always worse when she's around her friends. Irene stands in front of the whole group to say just how much she's going to miss us. I hope you all come to the end of summer party this weekend, she said, readjusting the knot of red hair on top of her head. We're going to grill out and we'll have ice cream and you can all bring your boards if you'd rather catch some waves. Nicolette sneers. These aren't even gold plated, she mutters. They're probably going to turn green in like a month. On the other side of me, Oliver Guzman holds his trophy in the air, admiring it. Where are you going to put yours, Alberta? In my room, I say, trying to ignore Nicolette. What about you? Our trophy case, she sh he shrugs when I give him a look. My parents are into it. They like to show it off when family comes over. We all give ourselves a hand, Irene's favorite way to close out each day of camp. Nicolette unzips her wetsuit and starts pulling her arms out, right and then left. I bend down to slip my trophy into my bag, and when I stand up, Irene is in front of me. Great work this summer, Alberta, she says, her blue eyes warm. Thanks, Irene. Then she smiles and leans in, whispering, you were the best one in camp, but don't tell anyone I said that. What? I barely have time to smile back before she's moving down the sand towards her assistant, Jed, who's breaking down the cardboard boxes that had held the trophies. Irene was quiet, but by the grin Oliver gives me, I know he heard, and I really hope he was the only one. Even if Nicolette didn't hear Irene, she can probably see it on me. I can't stop grinning, and my chest immediately puffed up with pride as Irene's words sank in. I watch, I watch Irene as she talks to Judd and then wanders away. She doesn't go up to anyone else and whisper in their ear. Aw, Nicolette's head is tilted to the side. 
as she looks at me with wide eyes. That's cute, Alberta. I know not to take the bait, but I do it anyway. What? That Irene tries to make you feel good about yourself here. I guess it's not like school, huh? I frown at her. I shall walk away, but like always, there's something inside me that plants my feet to the ground and makes me keep listening to Nicolette McKee. I hate that something. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Oliver watching us. Sorry, Nicolette says, not looking sorry at all. It's just that you're like different here and different there, but Irene tries to make it special for you. That's cute. I've been coming to surf camp since I was six years old. Three hours a day, four days a week for two months. I don't need camp to surf, but it's more fun to be with people who love it as much as I do. And I'm into everything about it except the fact that Nicolette is in my surf group. She'll take any chance to remind me that I don't look like other people in Ewing Beach, that she thinks I, doesn't, I don't fit in. I haven't said anything. Just like my feet are rooted in the sand, my lips are glued tightly together. Nicolette pauses, then blinks at me, her eyes even bigger. I mean, do you think you were the best surfer in camp? They had said not to respond to ignorance with ignorance, and I know it's never worth getting into it with Nicolette, ever, but sometimes I really want to. Yes, I finally say, I do think I was the best. I guess you just aren't as good as you think you are. My father probably would count that last part as an ignorance comment, but it's worth it just to see the way Nicolette's eyes narrow into the thinnest slits, and to hear Oliver snicker. Whatever, Alberta. She runs a hand over her wet ponytail, wringing out the last drops of water as she glares at me. That and she is not even worth a response. I turn my back to her, tuck my board under my arm, and look at Oliver. Ready? He nods and we head off together on our walk home, still wearing our wetsuits. Oliver lives two blocks over from mine, and not for the first time. I wish she were the one who lived across the street instead of Nicolette. What's her problem, Oliver says, shaking his head. I sigh. I've been trying to figure that out for years. You competing in the Pismo contest this year? Maybe. I hesitate. It's a very hopeful maybe. I'm not allowed to compete in surfing contests until I turn 13. My dad's rule, which I think is ridiculous. The contest is in a few weeks and I don't turn 13 until next year. But I'm hoping to convince them with my powers of persuasion. What about you? Nah, not really my thing. I mean, I like surfing, but soccer's more my sport. By the time you reach my street, my arm is cramping from holding my board. Maybe it's because it's the last day of camp, but I feel more exhausted than I have all summer. I say goodbye to Oliver at the corner and cross the street by the bed and breakfast that sits across the road from our house. Everything looks the same as always. The same Harris Inn sign swinging from the white wooden posts in front of the porch. Same avocado trees, its branches heavy with fruit and wait, there's a car in the driveway and it's not the silver one that the realtor drives. And the for sale sign is gone. The one that's been sitting in the yard for the last two months. Someone bought the B&B? My stomach gets those excited flutters that mean something big is about to happen. Who's going to move in? I can't imagine anyone living there but Mrs. Harris. Next to the B&B, little Stephen McKee is jumping up and down on his front porch, shouting at his nanny to hurry up so they can go to the beach. I roll my eyes. Stephen is five years old and he's the biggest brat I know. He's always talking to his nanny like he's the one in charge. And his parents never tell him to be nicer. I guess that's no surprise considering he's Nicolette's brother. Elliot says the entire family is cold. Oliver and I rinsed our boards under the beach shower before we headed home, so I take mine around back to let it finish drying. Then I peel off my wetsuit, hold it under the water spigot off the side of the house, and hang it to drip dry in the shade. When I walk around the back, the door is open, letting the breeze and letting out the sounds of Dad making lunch. I leave my surf bag on the porch, but I take out my trophy so I can put it next to the others in my room. How was it, Dad asks, as I kick off my sandy flip-flops and step inside. He's busy chopping up cucumbers for the quinoa salad, then he stops when he sees my trophy. Hey, look at that! It's not a big deal, Dad. Everyone gets one. I pad barefoot across the kitchen and give him a kiss on the cheek. But Irene said I was the best surfer in camp. Dad hoots with joy. Of course you did. Of course you were. Good job, sweetheart. And not just because it means we're getting our money's worth out of that camp, he winks at me. Can we put this one on the mantle? Maybe, I said, turning it around in my hands. Even though it doesn't seem important enough to go in the front room. Not like the ones you actually earn, like in the Pismo contest. I'm going to take a shower before we eat. As much as I believe what Irene said, I wish I could remember it without thinking of Nicolette, too. 
I don't think anyone besides Oliver heard Irene, but I wonder if they'd believe the same thing, that Irene only said that to make me feel special. I go to wash off all of the sweat, sand, and salt, then meet Dad back in the kitchen where he's finishing up the salad. I grab two bowls in one hand and two glasses with another. Then I bump the cabinet door closed with my album. Somebody bought the bed and breakfast? Oh, I meant to tell you, I spoke to the real estate agent yesterday, Dad said, nodding. The new owners just got here this morning. After Mrs. Harris died, her grown kids arrived in three different cars, taking out boxes and boxes of stuff. Then construction workers started showing up every day, wearing fluorescent vests and hard hats as they did renovations. Everyone in town thought maybe one of Mrs. Harris's kids would take over the bed and breakfast, especially her daughter who lives here in Ewing Beach, Mrs. Palmer. But dad said she's not interested in running a B&B, &B, and the other two kids live across the country and don't want to move to California. The real estate agent has shown it to a few people, but no one has lived or stayed there since June. It's the end of August now, which means the new owners are moving in just at the end of the busy season. Once the tourists stop coming, Ewing Beach looks like a ghost town. Do you know anything about the new neighbors, I ask? Putting silverware next to our bowls as dad brings the salad to the table. I love canola salad. Unlike my best friend Laramie, who says it feels like chewing on bugs. Laramie's family doesn't eat a lot of grains or salad. Their mom works a bunch and they eat a ton of fast food burgers and mac and cheese from the box and their brother's culinary concoctions, which are only edible about half the time. I'll try not to be too nosy, Dad says, spreading his napkin over his lap. I do the same. You didn't find out anything? Well, I found out two things that may be of interest to you, he says in a sing-songy voice that drives me crazy. He only uses it when he's trying to prolong the suspense, and it always ends up being more annoying than intriguing. I take a bite of salad and wait for him to go on. He really drags it out, chewing another couple of bites. When he takes a drink of water and then dabs the corner of his mouth with a napkin, I can't take it anymore. Dad, what did you find out? He laughs. Okay, okay. Well, I think it will be of great interest to you that, number one, the new neighbors have a girl just your age. I nearly dropped my fork on the floor. What? Really? There hasn't been anyone my age on the street since we lived here. And we've been here since I was two years old. I'm 12 now. It doesn't take long to get anywhere in Ewing Beach, but having a friend right across the street is something I've wished hard for and never expected to happen. Well, there's Nicolette, but she's a year older and definitely not a friend. Yep, she'll be in seventh grade next week, just like you. I keep picking up forkfuls of canola, but I'm too excited to eat. I have a bunch of questions. Questions I'm sure dad doesn't know the answer to, like what is her name and can she surf and is she a vegetarian too? But there's one more thing that he can answer. What's the other thing you know about them? I ask. You said there's two things. Ah, yes. Are you, are you ready? Dad, I give him my most exasperated look. It's not as good as Elliot's, but I think it's close. They're black, he says in a voice so boisterous he sounds like the announcer on The Price is Right, Elliot's guilty pleasure. What, I frown? Sure that I didn't hear him right? Finally, we won't be the only ones on the street, which means that finally, I won't be the only black girl in my entire grade. I rinse the dishes before I put them in the dishwasher, making sure to not leave a bit of food on the bowls or silverware. My other dad, Elliot, is picky about the kitchen, from the way the dishwasher is loaded to how the glasses are lined up in the cabinet. The lip of the glass should be down, not up. As I scrub canoa from the bowls, I think about the new neighbors. There aren't many black people in Ewing Beach, barely any besides me, dad, and Elliot. There are two boys a year older than me and a girl in the grade above them, but I'm the only black student in my grade. All the other black people in town are the same age as my grandparents and dads, or they're little kids who toddle around on the beach with diapers under their swimsuits. Even most of the tourists are white and now we'll have black neighbors? One who is a girl the, eight, the same age as me? I have an overwhelming urge to find out everything about her, but dad says we need to wait until tomorrow to introduce ourselves. Give us some time to settle in. I have plans with Laramie anyway. Her brother is working at the ice cream shop today. She texted early and said I should come downtown because he always gives us a free cone when he's there. I stuck my head in the office slash guest room. Okay, if I go down to meet Laramie at the creamery, Dad's frowning at his computer screen, but his worried eyebrows go back to normal when he looks at me. Of course, he says. Just promise you won't get butter pecan. Why wouldn't I? I like it. Which means I know I'll never be disappointed. He groans and looks to the ceiling. How did I end up raising a daughter so set in her ways? Have you seen the flavors that are getting in down there lately? Balsamic swirl? 
strawberry rhubarb, olive oil. Scrunch up my nose. No, thank you. Dad and Elliot are foodies, and I like most of the stuff they make, but I don't try new things very often, and I'm okay with that. Piney says, with a sigh, I guess I'll have to live vicariously through someone a bit more adventurous. Bye, Dad. Heading over to the gallery soon. Make sure you're back for dinner, Alberta, he calls after me. I wheel my mint green beach cruiser around the front of the house and look once more at the B&B &B before I push off. The car's still in the driveway, but I don't see anyone outside. I think back to the 4th of July when the construction workers and real estate agent were gone, but Laramie and I tried to break in. Well, not break in, not really. We just wanted to see what the place looked like now, but every door was locked tight, every window shade drawn shut. I pedal quickly down my street, cross Burton Boulevard, after looking both ways, then coast down Ewing Street, where everything in town happens. The air always smells like salt here, but it's stronger now that I'm closer to the beach. I have to get off my bike after a while and walk it next to me, because the, sideway, the sidewalk is too cluttered with tourists to ride, and the street is too cluttered with cars waiting for the tourists who spill out from the sideways to mosey along. Coleman's Creamery is the perfect spot on Ewing Street, sandwiched between Rosa's Tacos and the Surf Shop three of my favorite places. I luck up my bike on the side of the building since all the racks out front are full. Once the summer's over, my bike will probably be the only one here. Instead of a bell, the creamery makes a moving sound when you walk in. I used to think it was funny when I was little. Dad or Elliot would let me push open the door and I'd squeal each time as if it were the, my first visit. So embarrassing now to have a cow sound every time you open the door. I keep my head down as I walk to the counter. Laramie Mason is sitting on the stool in front of the cash register, legs swinging back and forth as she licks at her cookies and cream filled waffle cone. I think her legs are at least three times longer than when we finished sixth grade, and that was only a couple months ago. I don't understand how she's getting taller while everything about me is staying the same. Hey, I slide onto the seat next to her. The stools are the old fashioned kind with red glitter vinyl seats that swivel around. Hey, she bumps me with her shoulder. I tried to wait for you, but he was almost out of cookies and cream and I was totally craving it today. I had to act fast. It's okay, I say, looking behind the counter. Laramie's big brother, Leaf, is scooping up ice cream. Laramie and her brother are the ones with hippie names, but she's always teasing me about my family being the real hippies. I guess because we don't eat meat and we only use all natural cleaning products and soap from local companies, and dad has a compost bin in the backyard, and I don't think that makes us any more hippie than a lot of people in California, but before I was born, Dad and Elliot lived on an artist's commune. They lived and made art with dozens of other painters and sculptors and illustrators. Then Elliot went back to school so he could be a professor and Dad decided to open an art gallery. The commune is where they met. It's also where they met my surrogate mother, Denise. Leaf rings up some customers and checks to make sure no one else is waiting. Then he walks over to me with a smile that shows off his perfect white teeth. Laramie complains that everybody thinks Leaf is so cute, but it's a fact. He's 16 and he looks like what people think of when they think of California boys. He is tan and has floppy golden hair and big sparkly blue eyes. How's it going, Alberta? He gives me a high five even though I think I'm getting too old for high fives from him. Or maybe it's annoying because I don't think boys his age high five girls they think they're pretty. What can I get for you? It's going good. Can I get a scoop of butter pecan? Got a new flavor on this week, Leaf says. Key lime pie. Want to try it? I shake my head. No, thank you. Just the usual, please. Butter pecan and a sugar cone. Got it, he says, saluting me. I always like Leaf because he's a surfer like me. He's on the Ewing Beach High surf team, and sometimes I'll go with Laramie and his mom to watch his contests. We don't have a surf team in middle school, but as soon as I get to high school in two years, I'm trying out. Leaf, cur Leaf carefully hands me the cone with the small square napkin wrapped around the bottom. On the house, he says. He always says that, even though he knows Laramie and I wouldn't be up here so often if the ice cream weren't free. Thank you, I smile at him. When he goes to the other end of the counter to help a customer, I turn to Laramie. A new family is moving into the bed and breakfast. No way. She takes the first bite of her waffle cone with a hearty crunch. Someone's finally moving into the Harris Inn? Yeah, my dad says they have a daughter our age. They just moved in today. Finally, we'll have someone our age on my street. Well, technically you have Nicolette. Nicolette is the worst person I know. Laramie laughs. Come on, Alberta, the worst? Stare at her. Give me one good reason I should like Nicolette McKee. 
I don't know. She was just up here with her brother and nanny. I saw them outside and she said, hey. So just because she said hi to you, she's nice? Clear me size. I didn't say that. I just, she's not the worst person I know. Ugh. I hate when Laramie gets like this. Like she's forgotten all the terrible thing, things Nicolette has said to me over the years. I wouldn't forget if someone had said those things to her. Well, the new neighbors are black, I say, getting back to what we were supposed to be talking about. I don't want to think about Nicolette. Nice, Laramie says. Nice? I take a bite of butter pecan and roll the cool cream around in my mouth until it melts on my tongue. I feel like she should be saying more than nice, but I guess I don't know exactly what I want her to say. I think it's really nice. There definitely aren't any black people on my street. There's barely any at school. What about Rashawn and Noah, Laramie says. She's counting them off on her fingers, which makes me feel weird. Forgot about Deanna, I say after a few moments. Oh, right, she's going into ninth grade. Exactly, she doesn't even go to our school anymore. Even if she was there, four people isn't a lot. I'm the only black kid in our grade. Laramie looks down at her cone, nodding slowly. I guess I never thought about it. You're just you. You're Alberta. You blend in. I don't really think about you being black. I get that same, same tight feeling in my stomach, like when she's counting names on her fingers. I want to say that, yes, I am Alberta, but part of being Alberta is being black. And I don't blend in here in Ewing Beach. That is something else I know for a fact. But Laramie is my best friend. I don't think she meant anything by it, and I don't want to start a fight. She's been kind of mopey lately. Change the subject. Ask her what she's wearing on the first day of school so I don't accidentally say something that makes me sound as annoyed as I am. So if that sounds good and you want to find out what happens to Alberta and see her meet Edie and figure out the journal mystery, pick up a copy of The Only Black Girls in Town by Brandi Colbert at Aurora Public Library today.